This week on Panelism, it's a space western copperhead. Hello and welcome to Panelism, the podcast where we talk about the comics and graphic novels worth having on your shelf. I'm Todd A. I'm Taylor Trask. Hey, Todd. Hello. And once again, it's been a while since we've recorded. I know. <laughs> and uh, I know. it's just. It's but just we've the got. Way I mean, of the world. Things are happening. I'm, uh, I'm. Things are happening. Yeah, I'm a resident of a new city. I actually officially live in San Diego County now. Um, it's uh, it's been exciting. And before now, just for those who pay attention to these sorts of things, you were living previously on the outskirts, right? Or at least not in the, in the city. In the behind the orange curtain in uh, Orange. Behind County. the orange curtain. Ah, yeah. that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now you're in San Diego proper. Now you're like you are Ron Burgundy. You can. I, I'm still just in the county. I'm not in the city. So I'm. Uh, oh, okay. I'm in the. I'm in to the north. I'm in a, a little surf town up north of uh, the city. But yeah, it's going to make commuting to Comic-Con so much easier if we ever do that in person again. Um, I I, surely (laughs) at some point, I mean, now that's a great question though. It's what we are talking now in mid February. I would imagine they'd have to make a call on that pretty soon. I, I think so. I think, I think we're going to hear something maybe in March. I have no idea what I'm, what I'm basing that on except for previous announcements. Um, Yeah. Well, and last year caught them a little off guard, obviously. Um, I, I just don't think they can do it this year. I, and I don't think should, they should try. Because we watched LA Comic Con try to delay. And mm-hmm. like they, they, theirs was, you know, after the summer. So we got notices from LA Comic Con saying, hey, we're not changing anything just yet. And then it was like, okay, we are. We're going to go online. And, and then it was like, but we're going to postpone the real show till December. And then, of course, comes, mm. OK, we can't do this in person. <laughs> we'll see you next year. And to me, yeah, it felt yeah. like so many like like they were just, it was like watching someone trip in slow motion. Like, dude, you should have just canceled this off the bat, you know, and gone online for 2020 and, you know, scrubbed it entirely. Um, so I I kind of think San Diego is such a huge uh, event that I, you know, unless they massively strip it down, because you think of like how international it is even if California were at a, a good percentage of vaccinated, you know, we can't have a whole bunch of visitors come in unvaccinated and, you know, cause a super spreader event. What are yeah. we, what are we, yeah. the NFL? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Let's just, just have this talking. Super Bowl in person. <laughs> I was looking to see if South by Southwest is happening. Cause that's March uh, of this year. And it looks right. like it is. Um, oh, wait, no, SS, no, no, I was wrong. It's online. South by Southwest is online yeah. in 2021. So they're doing a total virtual event, which is probably best. Um, but yeah, it's, I would guess because people are going to have to start making plans to travel. Right. And I think just that idea of traveling, if you're not in the area of flying and all of that is, is probably the biggest consideration. But, you know, to your point too, bringing people in from all, you know, all across the country and the world and, you know, mingling them and everything. Would you imagine they do a very very limited in-person comic-con where it's like you know we're gonna cap the we're gonna cap ticket sales at like a really small number um that would or is that that would be cool um you know and and i i see that there's a way to do safe protocols and stuff that you know much like schools are doing or something you know like per, yeah require a negative test within you know two days of attending and you know, monitor temperatures at the the doors and stuff. But it's such a free for all that that level of management has got to be a logistical nightmare. So it's almost better to just leave it in its like rough state and say, we'll try this later. (laughs) Yeah, probably best. Um, Well, they didn't really like, I mean, last year did catch them by surprise, but I was very underwhelmed with their, uh, their virtual event considering all the talent and ideas that they could have made that even cooler. So they go virtual this year. They better put some extra thought into it. Cause it just, it kind of felt flat last year when, you know, even the graphics packages and stuff were just like, I mean, do you have illustrators all over the country who could easily right. chime in on this? Like utilize well, that talent. I, 
I th- honestly, that's a that's a in- interesting impression because I think it was very true to life of the panels themselves. You know, you go into this panel mm-hmm. and you feel like, oh wow, it, you know, it doesn't take a lot to get a <laughs> panel at San Diego Comic Con because a lot of them just don't have good art and the slideshow doesn't work or what, you know, it's like, yeah. it's amazing how many little technical things they do keep working well. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's all, it's almost like better that a lot of panels are low fi uh, by design because it's easier to keep the technology functioning there. You know, it's what the miracle is that things like Marvel and DC have those huge and Sony do those enormous presentations. Cause that, yeah. that requires so much, but, but I agree. It's like, if you're an, if you've never attended it and you're missing the glamorous sort of like exciting part of it and all you see are the panels online, it's a little underwhelming or a lot underwhelming, but I, you know, I, I liked those panels that I watched and I hope, I, I almost think we, that should be a regular thing. Like, let's just have a com- mm. comics hangout every, um, you know, every That's month or something. That's a good idea. Well, and then Comic Con SDCC specifically could, if they did that, if they did the virtual panels on a rolling basis throughout the year, they could use it to uh, build almost like a farm team of talent. Like you and I could yeah. do a panel and maybe get in their rotation and maybe host, you know, host one live or something. There's all kinds of advantages to that. It's we'll see, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I'm sure, like you said, in about a month, we'll we'll know, um, especially if they're trying to hit a June July timeline. So. More yeah. on that as we progress through the year. But you, you've got a book today, as we usually do. And I, I do. remember texting you earlier today. You said uh, you were going to review Copperhead Volume 1, which I was a little excited about because I read that. Oh, God, it's been about two or three years now. Yeah. Um, and I read it digitally. I think it was a com- I think it was a um, pan- uh, bleh, comicsology. I was about to say a panelismology. A comicsology... <laughs> Um, pick that, you know, it's like Comixology does that thing where they will put, you know, uh, trade paperbacks, you know, know, volume ones out there to kind of tease you and then you you grab the rest. And so they did that and I remember really liking it. And it was one of those image titles that came out in sort of that beautiful 2015, 2016 time when just like everything was, everything image did was gold. Um, at least to me. And so I, I was kind of excited to hear you talk about it now. So, so jump on in. Yeah, and that's a great setup. And what I like, too, is the history of this, because right when we started the show, like five, six years ago, which is crazy to think that that's when we did it, um, we it was like right around the time Image was still selling everything through their website. And you know, it was, it was their heyday, and it was very exciting. And you could just buy a CBZ or a PDF like right from Image. And they would do these mm-hmm. sales of all the single issue, like number ones of all their series. For so it was every like every number one was a buck, and right around oh, yeah, the time yeah, we yeah. had started our podcast, I think even in those early shows we talked about like oh go to you know we just went to Image and bought all these like number ones and Copperhead number one was one of those that I bought mm-hmm. like in 2015. Um, although that I don't know I go oh, I, wait is that right? Um, yeah yeah yeah. So I bought number one in 2015. Volume one had already come out um, okay in March of 2015. And so I think that timeline is about accurate. And then I think the next time it sort of came into my view was the comic book club that I was participating in. Uh, It was, it was like voted on and I don't know if we actually did a show on it, but I remember it being pitched in the, in the book club. And I was like, Oh yeah, this sounds really cool. How have I slept on this? Because obviously I, you know, but like, (laughs) 27 <laughs> single issues in those sales or whatever. And I didn't actually read all of them. I might've just sort of flipped through it and, you know, not get pursued it, or I might not have even opened it or whatever. Um, and it is now comiXology at least has volumes one and two available to borrow right now. So oh, cool. it's, it's easy to keep catch up on. Uh, as I mentioned, volume one was published in March of 2015. Um, and it was, I like that you call that the image heyday. It definitely was. And it was interesting to read it now in 2021 and think of sort of like how it fit into that family of image titles mm-hmm. like Black Science and Saga and um, just, you know, those are the Wicked big ones Divine. I was reading. Right. Yeah. Wicked Divine's a good one. And I was thinking. East pa- West. Oh, East of West. I wasn't even thinking of that. Paper Girls would have come after this, I believe. But yeah, that was a little bit later, but they not were all that much later. Yeah, all sort of in my mind as I read it. Um, the writer was Jay 
and I believe it's pronounced Farber, although he has a, a, a it's like A E in his name. Um, and then artist is Scott Godlewski. I uh, hope I'm getting both of those right. Um, and one of the really cool things about Volume One Trade Paperback, just to jump to the DVD extras before we even talk about the book, is at the end there is a in sort of supplemental materials, there is a correspondence between them as they're planning out oh, the book. And you can cool. tell it is so raw. Like it's literally like, hey dude, we should do a book that's like a, a Western set on a planet in space. And then it's like, oh, I'm thinking it's an abandoned town. And then the other guy throws back like, what if it's like a, you know, a corporate town that's basically owned by a corporation and they send in a new sheriff. And so it's really cool to watch it develop through a series of correspondence. Um, and, and it also makes you realize that a, a, t- a title like this, where it is creator owned and it is image, it doesn't have to be this, um, you know, I picture um, uh, 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 Jonathan Hickman's like studio looks like when they're trying to find the murderer in like a, you know, Zodiac killer TV show. And there's a bunch of threads stuck to post-it notes all over and, you know, <laughs> photos like pinned into the board and stuff like that's Jonathan Hickman's mind. Um, he's planning it all out before <laughs> he puts the pin on the paper yeah, maybe, uh, but it's clear like, Oh, these, these guys just wanted to have like a fun little genre story. And that's what they did. Um, nice. I almost wish I'd read that before reading the book because I think it would have, it would have gotten me excited to see how it turned out. So that's why I'm okay. mentioning it at the top of the show is like, it's kind of cool to see that it, it started from this little germ and turned into this because it's, um, uh, I guess I'll get, I'll get to that when I hit the story. But the, as I mentioned, the setting is like a space Western and it is very genre, uh, genre fied, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the, um, the sh- a new sheriff comes to town and her name is uh, Clara Bronson. So it's clearly playing off of like taking names from, you know, that just sound Western like Zeke and Clara and stuff like that. But also Charles Bronson is the last name. And, you know, it's, it's putting all those things in your mind. Like you're in a genre, yeah, yeah. you're in the Western. The, te- well, the- let me pause, pause. Real oh quick yeah. Yeah. Because wh- I want to say right at the outset, the space Western genre is so hard to crack. Um, we've hmm. seen many examples over the years, especially in movies where they've tried. I mean, the more recent contemporary example is uh, Cowboys and Aliens. Genius and movie. that was, and there's been, there's been some other, and that was, you know, everything ideally was going for it. It was John Favreau coming right off of, of Iron Man 1 and 2. Yeah. Um, I think Damon Lindelof was involved in the writing. In fact, I know he I was. And then that, you know, he was still, at that point in time, this is before his kind of exile and then you know, glorious return during Watchmen. But like, he was involved. There's just a lot of great talent, great cast. But I would argue the problem with it, as is the problem with most of of these, you know, most of that genre, the the sci-fi western or space western genre, is that they it was anchored in the old west, and they introduced mm. sci-fi space elements into the old west instead of saying we're just going to go to another planet or another reality or another universe and it will feel like a western but it the location and the the characters will be exotic um, i would argue like the the speaking of hickman the um the really great series that i'm following currently is decorum as i've mentioned before decorum does a similar thing it's got it, it's chock of chock a block of like western iconography and and references and things, but it's completely and totally a, you know, a galactic story it has nothing to do with earth. It has nothing to do with like our history. Um, and it's just, it, it works because you can play and expand as much as you want to, but it still feels like a Western. It has those trips. So I mm. like, I like that the, some of the signposts, if you will, are things like naming conventions and right. I'm sure as you'll get to like things like at the, you know, the aesthetic, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the dust and all that stuff. I would argue too, this is also why, Star Wars, at least the a New Hope, function and even the, uh, definitely the Mandalorian function as right. as westerns because it's it's you know you you see Luke on a desert planet and there's just sort of the, the whole the whole uh, Moss Eisley sequence is is I mean absolutely like him and Obi Wan walking into a saloon basically I mean it's like it's totally. got all those beats Mandalorian yeah. you could go on and on we could do a whole show about that but again it's it's taking the western motif and and uh, sort of surgically grafting it on to a sci-fi space world instead of doing the opposite. And I think every well, time it fails, it's the opposite. 
I, that's such an interesting perspective because I've never thought of it in in bolting it on like that it matters which way you do it. But so full disclosure, I don't really like what I've seen of the show Firefly. Um, okay. I know it has like diehard fans. I don't know if, oh, yeah. if you count yourself among them. But I do not. <laughs> it to me is even though it is on another planet, it goes mm-hmm. out of its way to be like, remember this we're in a western you know it's yeah. like all nudge nudge wink wink whoa, you know whoa, 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 we're, whoa. is we're firefly wearing... on another planet uh well don't they fly earth? in between planets yeah but earth is part of it right I mean, yeah yeah have... that's true it's yeah. not a different universe um yeah but okay. it's you know the the i can't, can't even remember when the the priest shows up and they you know they have a name for him that's like very old western you know mm. um and the and they're you know they're wearing dusters and boots and it's it's yeah, so yeah. westerny it's it's corny that's what I mm-hmm. find about it. My apologies to the brown coats or whatever you call yourselves. Um, it is very corny. <laughs> I I, um, I don't like it for a variety of reasons, but just sort of how cheap it all feels. And I understand like the time in which it was made, but I have a similar reaction to to Firefly. Yeah, and I don't, and it's not that I think Copperhead is some genius comic. In fact, I think that's something I want to get into with with talking about genre fiction. Um, but I I like your distinction because in uh, Copperhead, it is Copperhead is the town, like a a defunct mining town on a mm-hmm. planet. I we assume it's a planet called Jasper. Um, actually, we know from the beginning that it's a planet. Uh, one of those other touchstones of this planet is named Jasper there's mention of another planet named Laramie. So they're naming the planets after like Wyoming towns, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, So uh, Clara Bronson and her son Zeke touchdown, you know, opening scene is they're on a train, a maglev train um, shooting across the desert to Copperhead, this mining town where she has been um, transferred as the sheriff. And there's the, the history of this place comes out through the story. There's no prologue. There's no scroll that tells you what's going on. It's, you know, she's on the train. There's a confrontation with the sleazy stranger. And then a, a someone steps in to, you know, uh, fisticuffs this stranger that's like propositioning her. All very like, tr- you know, tropes of the genre. Um, she's dismissive of... Um, the the alien who is her uh, deputy, you know, um, and there's the one of the early scenes is that, uh, you know, uh, while she leaves her son at home, a neighboring the neighboring child comes over and says, my dog is lost. Can you help me find him before it gets dark? Because you don't want to be in the Badlands after dark. And, <laughs> you know, it's like you can just you could almost predict the beats of the story. But does that turn you off to it? Did you at any time feel like, well, or were you more curious to go? Where is this? Is this going to head somewhere new? And so that's why I brought up like that. I was reading it with those other image titles in mind. Like I kept thinking like, okay, around, you know, around this time, like all these big ideas were coming out of image and the art in this has a very image look to it. Um, Yeah. There's definitely a pulp influence, but it's not trying to be a pulp comic. And it's not as arty as like Saga or Black Science, you know, but it's like mm-hmm. s- squarely in the wheelhouse of Image Comics. You know, this is not Marvel or DC, it's Image. And yeah. I, so all, I read the first couple of issues thinking like, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm along for the ride, but I'm not f- fully invested in it. And then there was just some part where I committed to like, you know what, this is a genre and I have... Qu- quoted this other uh, this person I saw on a, a panel at a comic-con one time who said in genre fiction you lean into tropes you know <laughs> like that mm-hmm. is That's what true. you do I remember you saying that and at that point it just sort of clarified and then it was like I'm here I'm in I'm on the ride you know um, mm-hmm. and I, I really enjoyed it after that and I especially loved treating it like this is the only volume I need to read you know like I was interesting I was okay. really can, and this that is a refresher when reading an image title to me because I, around issue three, realized this is going to wrap up in this volume. Like the story that I'm following is going to wrap up and much like a Western serial novel or, you know, or TV show, it's like there's going to be a, a bookend 
and I can go to the next volume if I'm interested, but I don't need to worry about volume one like, oh boy, are they, you know, are they going to drop all these threads by, you know, are they going to land the plane in our Watchmen analogy? Like, yeah. you know, yeah. and how many volumes is that going to take? Like, that's the black science problem. This thing where I love the first like five volumes of that. And then I just started doubting that the creators were ever going to wrap it up in any satisfactory way. Mm-hmm. And th- I knew at some point, like, I guess because of the structure of it, it's like you get to the third issue and you realize like, oh, this is like a five act structure, you know, we're, <laughs> we're in for the like excitement and the denouement and then we're done. Um, and I, so I was just on board and I, I, there's Clara is, you know, the reason she's called away in the middle of the night and has to leave her son at home alone is that there has been this terrible murder out in the, you know, out in the badlands or maybe they're not in the badlands, but it's a, um, some of the natives, uh, a family of natives, which means aliens, um, or of course, like the, uh, um, you know, the analog to that in a Western would be like the native Americans. Uh, they, yeah, they actually yeah. call them the natives in the, in the fiction. And so okay. she goes out and there's been a murder of a whole family. Um, one son is, ha- you know, barely alive. So they bring him to the small town doctor. And of course there's only one doctor in town and he's drunk in the saloon, you know? And it's like every beat, you know, you're just like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. And, um, I just, I, I found myself really hooked by all that. Maybe because I was playing the game of like, Oh, what does this person represent? And that's why I bring up that the correspondence, because if I had read that correspondence and realized that like, that was literally how this started, you know, of how can we just take all the tropes of the Western genre and put them on a different planet? I think I would have been hooked from the beginning and been like, okay, now my eyes are open to like watch for all those tropes, you know? Yeah. Um, Hmm. um, See, almost, I would almost have had, because I vaguely remember that that letter exchange when I read it. Um, I would have almost had the opposite reaction, though, because mm. if, if somebody telegraphs every move to me, right? Um, I'd Good be point. like, well, yeah, but where are you, what are you going to do with all these tropes? And are you just are you just showing off that you know them all or is it actually to some end? And I think they I think I mean, you'll probably get there, too. But I think from what I remember, they it, it all congeals nicely into just like a beautiful sort of multi genre stew. Mm. But then at the same time, like if I knew that going, if somebody had pitched it to me, like, dude, it's a, it is a, it is a Western, but like it's on another planet and they, all they do is just do all your favorite Western things. They'd be like, right. Oh, all right. But then all of a sudden now I have, I have all the reference points of my favorite Western things by which to judge it. And I'm going to be very, very critical about like, well, is this, are they going to get this one or are they going to get the versus just kind of letting it wash over you and then me like, Oh, that's what they were up to. I mean, teach their own but i just i it's interesting that you took that as a as a positive yeah well and no that's a great point to because i i because what you're reflecting to me is that um part of that is that i sometimes when we do this podcast we decide on the book we're going to read before we're actually done like i i may tell you i'm doing a uh in this case i didn't but in many times i'll tell you like i'm going to do this book and then i go into it not really knowing what i'm going to think about that book um, so when I got to those letters, it was almost like, oh, well, this was my homework, you know? <laughs> ah, yeah. So in that homework sense, yeah, it w- might've been cool to me to have read the correspondence first, but I, but I, I think you're right as a casual reader, that's better as like the director's commentary in the end. Um, yeah, yeah. Great way to so, put it. So, uh, and not, you know, but I hope I haven't spoiled anything. I think it's still very enjoyable. And, and that's oh, the great thing about not. this genre is it can't really be spoiled because all, all you can do is like break a little bit of new ground. And I think they do that, you know, with this. Um, I, I actually loved that there wasn't an explanation of all the different species on the planet because there mm-hmm. are clearly many different forms of aliens. Um, mm-hmm. And then there is the artificial life which is a um you know like an android that was created by the humans to execute their war on the natives of this planet so um those arties who are still around somehow can be scanned to see if their like programming is intact and they are still good or evil um it's like clara uh, an arty uh, uh which they do not like to be called but an arty uh, saves her son and the neighbor's daughter in this conflict when they're out in the badlands after dark. Um, 
which, like I said, shouldn't spoil anything because this is just a, the beat of the story that you would expect. Um, and then Claire of is, of course, su- suspicious of this person. And so there's going to be that undercurrent of like, you know, how does that person, how, how does she begin to trust this, this artificial life? And, and so in those ways, the history of this planet comes out through the, the actual fiction. And it also doesn't have a whole lot of what we've become used to of like that, whether it's a first or third person narrator in all the captions, like yeah. where that happens, it's, it really feels in character to the story. Like it, it's at the beginning, it's like Clara, you know, you, I think the assumption is she's writing some sort of email or something to a, 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 a person. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's not, uh, boy, it's not that like omniscient narrator, you know, on a lonely desert planet, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. We find a maglev train. Um, so because of that, you're not getting like sort of this, um, like you're not getting loaded with like all this lore, you know, you're just learning it in, in the whole thing. Like, and there's a great, which is, I mean, th- that in itself is a bit of a Western trope too. If you think about it, like yeah. one of my favorite, well, I'll give you two of my favorite movies. They're very popular, so there shouldn't be any surprise. Like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly ranks as my number, I mean, the best Western ever made, in oh. my opinion. And then I also really, really like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I would argue Butch Cassidy is not, I mean, it looks and feels like a Western, but it is probably, it's more it's something else. It has a right. different sort of tone to it. But Good, Bad, and The Ugly, and even Butch Cassidy, uh, that's why I included it in this example, they don't spend a lot of time really holding your hand and good, bad and the ugly really doesn't like you have yeah. no idea what Clint Eastwood's backstory is. You have no idea what like the, um, uh, what, uh, angel eyes backstory is. And you, you g- get glimpses of it as they move through the story. So like a key scene in good, bad and the ugly is when, and spoilers, if you haven't seen it, I mean, God help you. But like, there's a scene where after, um, after some back and you know, back and forth and some, you know, uh, the, 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 um, Tuco, the the ugly character, and then uh, Clint Eastwood's character, um, they end up at a at a sort of a, what do you want to call it? like a parsonage, like a like a like a almost like a convent out in the middle of like the Texas desert, and like uh, Tuco's brother is there, and he's a he's a priest, and it gives you a beautiful opportunity for like the the brother to explain like why Tuco is the way he is. So you get little touches of that throughout and there's plenty of other examples, but I think that is a Western thing where it's like, we're just going to drop you in to the story as it's happening and you have to figure out or insinuate your own backstory, but we're not going to like load you down with it. There's not going to be, you know, kind of going back to like the kind of image books that were coming out at this time. There's not going to be some like full page spread infographic that explains everything, which oftentimes yeah. I love, but like not in this story, like you don't need, like exactly. 10, 10 pages being like, well, in this eight, this race and this race, and now, you know, and I'm back to the story. And like, that's not what this is. Like, I'm glad they didn't try to do that here. Exactly. And it's, um, you know, there's, there's that huge trope of like the stranger comes to town and you don't know if yeah. that's like danger or whatever, but there's also, this is sort of the, um, uh, boy, and this might be a bad, uh, example of it but this is the this is the there's a new sheriff in town story you know okay (laughs) and um which is maybe a bit tombstone ish you know uh yeah i'm not really sure if that's exactly how that that one wider comes to town but anyway um uh that's tombstone there's a lot of there's a a lot lot of stuff in stories yeah but yeah but it's the new sheriff you know he's got to establish law and order and etc and you're right. You don't need a whole lot of that. You don't need a whole infographic. In fact, if I had run into that, I would have really disliked it. Um, yeah. I liked just being in the world and, you know, like, like I said, I have these, I have these touchstones of the genre, but I'm not having to, uh, uh, I don't know. It just, (laughs) it was a breath of fresh air in a lot of image comics that, you know, have made me afraid. Are they going to land the plane? And after how many volumes are they going to land that plane? So, um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. And I thought there was enough there in that history. That's barely told to justify later volumes. Um, you know, let's hear more of the story of the, the arties and like, who are these aliens and why did they fight a war on this planet, et cetera. Um, oh, I did want to mention there is that one, there's one really um, 
you know, again, like a, a flashback you might have been able to, that would have felt familiar to you, even if you didn't predict it. But it's it's one of the few sequences in the art where um, that I, I just thought was very well done, where it's like, you know, you're not having to follow something new and confusing, uh, but they have almost filmed it or uh, drawn it like it's a film where uh, Boo, her deputy, um, um, whose real name I will not try to pronounce, is chasing after a, the criminal, the suspect. And so panel after, like every second panel is like desaturated and is is him um, or, or them in their uh, like military garb. So as he's on this mission from his new human sheriff, you know, chasing a criminal, he's flashing back to the war he fought against the humans. And it's like just this really cool, like, hey, here's a panel in current time. Here's the flashback that's like a desaturated. He's in the military uniform performing the same action, basically, you know, like running, okay. running out where he shouldn't be. And yeah. it's just like, you know, that's enough like that. The story of the aliens, the um, there's some little interesting like policing stuff like they can't charge, you know, uh, a crime that's out in the Badlands because of this treaty they have with the natives. And so there's little things like, you know, that there's a real life touchstone for that, but it's also, okay, well, we've got a little, uh, you know, we've got all the little parts of a pulp fiction adventure here. And this is, I mean, it sounds, it's, it's a little funny. It almost sounds like, I'm not saying the Mandalorian cribbed from this, but it feels like kind of the spiritual you know, precursor to the Mandalorian where it's that same, because Mandalorian does the same things, right? It really leans right. into the Western tropes. It tries to appropriate them to tell the story whenever it can. And, it, and you get a lot of those same, you're like, I, I got to come to this town and help them do this thing. And then I'm, I'm on my way. I'm so out. It just sort yep. of has, <laughs> yeah. And it just, and, and Mandalorian still, and yeah, there's an overarching narrative um, that's important, but those it's, it's the individual stories that I think work just fine on their own where you could watch, you know, three episodes of the Mandalorian and be like, I'm good. And like, I wouldn't right. recommend it because where it goes ultimately is amazing. But like, you don't have to feel like you have to get to the very end to have gotten the story. Um, right. Which, and, you know, we've got, we, it's, it's refreshing too, because we have gotten so, I think in the last five to six years, so used to just the, the MCU, everything is continuity. Like everything relates to everything else. And you have to stay to the very end to like see everything. And, and even then after the credits, there's even more. And it's kind of nice to go, Oh, just trade paperback. Number one. Great. Like, you know, Wikdiv, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of speaking of other, other series from that same time, Wikdiv, my biggest problem was that it started off kind of that way where you're like, Oh, these are little, but I mean, you could tell they were building something bigger. And then it's just like, this is way too frustrating. <laughs> I need to just have, I would, I, can I just not buy one trade paperback? And then, you know, if I don't like two or three, I can come in four and feel like I haven't missed a lot. Like that's, there's, there's, there's value to that sort of storytelling. And I'm glad this, this book took advantage of it. Yeah. And I, that's a great, the Mandalorian is such a great um, example too, because one of the things you and I have talked about um, through the last year of uh, our, our pandemic is, um, is wrestling with that, like, you know, do you want the serious work that you gotta, like, you gotta invest a lot of time in, or do you want the sort of like surface level entertainment? And I am one of those people to my shame that has dipped into the Mandalorian, watched several episodes and just not binged it because I'm like, you know, I enjoy each episode, but I, I don't feel this need to like get it all. Like I'm, I'm kind of yeah. actively trying to avoid the lore and stuff. And so I think for that reason, Copperhead came along at the right time for me because, mm -hmm. um, and that's probably why I didn't, you know, the, the very reason I didn't read it in 2015 is probably the same reason I read it now. You know, it's like, because then I wanted a black science where I'm like, you know, invested in some huge world building exercise. And now it's like, dude, I just need to check in and out, <laughs> you know, yep, yep. give me something that it, I, that entertains me for a couple hours and then let me put it to bed. I don't want to be invested in some, <clears throat> you know, long uh, cycle. I mean, that is a, that is an important consideration in purchasing any books now going forward. I think unless it's like a drawn and quarterly book where it's just like, you know, it's just, that is what it is. I mean, like I, when I walk into a shop, I honestly have to go, especially when there's like an issue, you know, volume one of something that just came out. And there's, there's been several examples recently of that, um, where I'm like, okay, do I want to commit to this? 
um, over the course of like, you know, three potential years. Like I, man, I don't know. And then if I, if I yeah. bail, am I going to feel bad about it? Like, you know, a book like Postal, which I've talked about before, oh, is, yeah. is a, is, is one of those where you do want it to be, you know, you want it to go five years because you're like, man, there's so many stories to tell about this town where I can like, you know, delve in and out. And there's, you know, th- that kind of works. But then there's like, for every one of those, there's like a die, you know, D-I-E, which I just gave up on. Cause I'm like, I, where are they going with this? And so it's, I think there's a nice balance. It, it's interesting. I would, man, in my heart of hearts, the interview I would love to get for us would be Eric Stevenson, who's the publisher of uh, Image. He's the one that like, you know, kind of sets the, the editorial schedule and, um, you know, which books to emphasize. But like, I'd love to know if there's any sort of thought that goes into that, that balance, mm-hmm. um, you know, that goes into this. A couple other questions I had for you as, as it relates to specifically the story. You know, at the end of it, did you feel like, did you want to, you know, are you interested in doing volumes two, three, and four? Or are you, you kind of good where you are? I'm pretty good where I am. I, okay. uh, because of the nature of the Comixology app, when I finished reading, yeah. it said, volume two, borrow? And I clicked borrow immediately. I was like, yeah, I want to read volume two. And I, I clicked borrow. And um, then it said, you've already borrowed 50 titles. Do you want to return one? And I said, <laughs> no. <laughs> and so, and I also felt like, wow, that's 50 books in my TBR pile that I didn't even buy. <laughs> now we and, know the limit. I didn't know if there ever was a limit. It's good to know there is. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> I, I got enough. Um, and so instantly after that, when I went to the, my books page on comiXology, I I thought, no, 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 I want to, I want to jump into one of these other titles next. You know, I don't want to continue with Copperhead Mm -hmm. right now, but it is great to know that it's out there and that there's at least a few volumes of it. And that it's like a, it's like a Zane gray Western novel where it's like, you could pick up any one of them and read it out of order and it doesn't matter, you know? Um, yeah, it's a good reference point too. I haven't thought about that series in, or that author in a long time. Uh, and I <laughs> told you, which is so funny when you can't find time to you know read or watch new stuff. Which is that I've recently rewatched Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, one of our favorite movies, which I have no idea how many times I've seen at this point a dozen. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a movie and and it's it, giving. And was thinking of the George Smiley novels and like. This is a, you know, I, I don't know where this falls in the order of them. And I actually have a number of them, you know, and haven't read them. And I wonder, you know, if it matters if I read them out of order. So anyway, hmm. um, yeah, it's uh, I. So, you know, I think I've I think there's a between the two of us, that was a pretty fair representation of Copperhead. I don't feel like I've done it a disservice, uh, but I also, you know, I'm we definitely want panelism to be about uh, things we liked and not just um, uh, criticizing things we didn't like. Um, but I think an important part of that is, is setting it in, you know, in the, in the galaxy am- among other stuff and letting you as a listener know, I, this is not like a saga. This is not a black science or East of West. This isn't a thing that's like so full of ideas that, you know, you're, you're going to have your own little, um, you know, um, uh, murderers, uh, <laughs> flow chart on your wall. Like you can just read yeah. Copperhead and go, that was cool. I almost wonder by the way, if it, and then we'll never know unless we ask Jay or Scott directly. Um, but I almost wonder if this was made just as it sounds like with your, your, the back and forth at the end, like they just made this to make a comic. It's like, we're not, we're not right. world building. We're not going to you know, license this to Netflix tomorrow. We're not building this to be like a five series movie. Like we're just going to make a comic book. It's going to be cool. And we're going to do these things with it. And that's it. And I, I, again, that's my assumption. Um, they may be like, no, hell no. We wanted to be, we wanted a, a Hulu series out of this. And if that's the case, great. I bring this up only because it's good to know that there are still things that exist in the world that aren't, you know, they aren't these multimedia empires from the beginning, which I right. feel... You know, Netflix, it, Netflix has a lot of deals going on with comics creators right now for, you know, some better than others. And so it's, it's, while I like seeing certain things adapted, I, you know, I, I'm being oddly critical in this episode and I apologize, but there's <laughs> a great example of this. There's a great comic series that's based on a great novel series called The Magicians. The novels are great from what I've heard. The comics that they've done are, are good because I've read those. 
but the show is kind of eh. um, like the show gets really watered down and I just worry with too many ad- adaptations we're going to run into just less good stuff and I think there are, there's a good case to be made I've made it before that a lot of these stories function in, in comics and should just that's that's as far as it should go um, you know Alan Moore makes that case about every yeah. one of his works um, and I think there's there's something to that and I think Copperhead's a really good example of that where like you can almost read it going I hope this doesn't get adapted or adapted. It, it could, you know, it could very easily get adapted and it would fit that sort of Mandalorian Gardens, Guardians of the Galaxy sort of motif, I think. But at the same time, it's like, no, just leave it, leave it as it is. Um, you know, do do other things with it in the comics medium, but don't don't adapt it that way. I, I just bring that up just because I'm thinking like it's I just I, any more. I'm just I'm very hesitant to to get into books where it's like. You know, we've got a whole plan. It's going to be this, and then there's going to be like five five seasons of a show, and then a movie, and then it's like, oh god, yeah. I don't want to and invest. It's, it goes back to that same fear of just not wanting to invest so much in a single story that it just it becomes exhausting. Right, and I think um, you know, part it's always good for us to restate our mission statement, which is is being those curators, and yeah. I, you know, Copperhead Volume One. I, I'm just trying to curate it and say it's worth your time, and and. You know, if you keep going, that's cool. But if not, that's also cool. Great. Well, if you yeah. want to keep going, talk about this segue, Todd. If you want to keep going <laughs> and listen to our other episodes, you can go back in the back catalog. We've, we're always surprised at which episodes are getting listened to, even as far back as you know the original Todd and Taylor show. So go back. They're all there. Just search for Panelism wherever you find podcasts. Um, and visit us at panelism.inc. That's panelism.inc. That uh, great place to find uh, the show as well as panelism.inc is our uh, on Instagram. That's our Instagram handle. And, um, you know, I keep threatening to, to do more with it this year. And I think I'll get there, you know, between the two of us. Well, that will be active again. Part of the problem is I'm just so I just don't like what Instagram has become, that it's just not as inspiring as it was, you know, two, three years ago. And now it's just like every 10th post is a real post and they're all the rest of the ads. <laughs> so we need to find another place to do fun visual social media stuff for the show. So if you got an example, let us know. Otherwise Instagram will be it for the time being, but right. Anything else? Did I miss? Did I forget anything? I, I think you covered it all and make sure to follow our Trello board. <laughs> JK. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> that's, that's more of a, that's more of a note for me. I set up the Trello board and then sort of forgot about it. And then Todd reminded me of it as we were starting. I was like, Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's where our whole, our whole editorial thing is. So that's all of our upcoming shows are there. Um, we, we have just yeah. as a difficult a time managing the, the non-social media between ourselves as we do managing social media. So um, yeah. Thanks for listening, and we'll I bl- be back. I blame the carryover from 2020. I blame the... It's, just, it's, we're, it's still with We're us. still pulling out of that wreckage, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great. Yeah, we're rebuilding. To, yeah, but it's been great. It's been great. Uh, and uh, we'll be back with my, my pick probably next week, hopefully. And uh, until then, sir. Yes. I will talk to you then, or I will talk to you at another time. That's what I'm supposed to say. We'll, we'll, fa- we'll fade out on that. <laughs>